Good evening and welcome to this webinar, uh, the first of its kind for us at Hope Farm and the first in a series of five to celebrate Hope Farm's 20th anniversary. Um, I'm really excited to welcome you all to the launch of this forum that may demonstrate some of the core principles that we have learned about and strive to demonstrate and research at Hope Farm. Having a quick look at our attendees list, it's amazing to have such a broad spread of individuals from different sectors within conservation, research and agricultural sectors and from different places, not just in the country, but across Europe as well. We have, we've had over 200 people registered for this event tonight alone um, and we're welcoming people from Norway, Brittany and Ireland right up to Aberdeen. So thank you all for joining us. Before going into the main introduction for me, um, just a few housekeeping points. Um, so the session is being recorded and will be available to view after the webinar. This will be sent to you after the event, but also will be made available on YouTube. There is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screens and please post any questions you have throughout the presentations in the Q&A box, which will be monitored by my colleague, Sophie. We'll then answer questions once all presentations are finished um, and we'll, when we come to the panel session. Um, please note that depending on time, we may not be able to get through all of the questions, um, in which case they'll be answered and put into a Q&A document after the event. Um, please note as well, we won't be reading out any personal info during the Q&A session. Um, so once again, good evening, and I better introduce myself. Um, I'm Georgie Bray, the fifth farm manager, um, having worked at Hope Farm for three years now, um, first as assistant farm manager before coming into this role. At Hope Farm, we're 450 acres or 180 hectares of arable farmland sitting in the south of Cambridgeshire. Um, 20 years ago, we purchased the farm to demonstrate and research wildlife friendly farming, setting up a baseline of monitoring wildlife across different groups changed management to diversify the rotation from the wheat, wheat and all seed rope rotation to now regularly including seven different crops in a flexible rotation. 15% um, of the land is managed for conservation purposes including trials and mid-tier stewardship and we have not used insecticides on the farm for the last two harvests. Um, research includes those both in conservation habitat management around the edge and in field, uh, both short and mid-term. Even though I've only been here for a relatively short amount of time in Hope Farm's life, I still have known for a long enough that what an extraordinary place this is. Just last week, I was walking out on the farm and saw a flock of a few hundred linnets and gold, diving between a hedgerow laden with berries and a winter seed mix. They were joined by 40 odd red wing and 80 starlings were moving across the field after the drill. To say Hope Farm is extraordinary is not to say that other wildlife, um, wildlife friendly farms aren't, far from it in fact. When we first purchased the farm, we were hoping to implement good and accessible wildlife friendly farming practices designed to maximise the value per acre for us as farmers, but value for money for the taxpayer too and for species in the UK that rely on farmland to survive. Especially in current times, which, although the remit of a conservation organisation running high productivity arable farm seems pioneering at the time, we aren't the only organisation to have done so. And we certainly aren't the only farmers to be providing a plentiful home for biodiversity either. If making these simple changes on farm increase breeding farmland birds, which are in constant decline by 130%, and overwinter farmland birds by 1500%, imagine what a difference we could make if this happened across the landscape as a connected network of wildlife friendly farms. Much of the demonstration work we talk about from the farm is not invented here but it's a mixture pot of all the lessons taken from conservation, agricultural and research organisations and from other farmers too. So although we are celebrating 20 years worth of Hope Farm in these webinars, this is celebrating 20 years worth of wildlife friendly farming practice originating from much further afield than just the RSPB. So now to come to this webinar in particular, 
and why we are talking about a tried and tested solution for wildlife friendly and high productivity farming. The my title might indicate to some that Hope Farm is the tried and tested and finished article in our eyes, but it is very far from it. Anybody who knows the farm and us well will willingly share that although we have broadly achieved our goals of maintaining at least similar levels of profit whilst increasing levels of biodiversity, we'll know that there is so much more to achieve. There is so much more to be done before we reach our end goal of understanding and practicing perfect, sustainable, wildlife friendly and highly productive farming, if it even exists and is possible. If anybody in this webinar knows how to answer, how to do all of that perfectly, then please do let us know in the Q&A box. So if we aren't the tried and tested finished article, what is? Although the solutions at the individual farm level aren't absolute, there are certainly tried and tested principles for wildlife friendly farming in this kind of system that have been built upon and continue to be built upon year and year and are relevant much further afield as well. Hope Farm is a key demonstrator of those principles in providing wildlife habitats for wildlife throughout the life cycles. So that in essence is what each of our speakers tonight will be walking us through. The Farm Wildlife Partnership six point plan and innovative ways that farmers are using the tried and tested principles to suit their own farms. We will then delve deeper into Butterfly Conservation's thoughts on looking after butterflies on farmland, who are one of the organisations involved in the Farm Wildlife Partnership. We'll then finish with a talk from Fair to Nature, a label that allows farmers to market their produce with the scientific backing of the exceptional value their farm has for wildlife, which again bases much of the standard on the farm wildlife plan. So without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker, Richard Winspear. Um, Richard's family roots are in market gardening and dairy farming. He studied ecology at the University of Leeds and did a research degree in woodland birds before starting work with the RSPB in 91. His RSPB career has been exclusively working with farmers initially on the Stone Curly project based in Wiltshire, before becoming agricultural advisor in 99. He sat on the technical group for arable options in agri-environment schemes and the Leaf Advisory Board. He has chaired the biodiversity subgroup of the Voluntary Initiative and the Environmental Land Management Group for the Campaign of the Farmed Environment. Richard instigated farm, the Farm Wildlife Partnership in 2014, which has become a key way for us to talk about wildlife friendly farming since. Richard will be talking more generally about the farm wildlife plan to start us off. A key relevance to Hope Farm here is that we sit as an arable demonstrator site for the farm wildlife plan. Of course, there is much more to Hope Farm, to farm wildlife than examples for what we have, we have achieved for biodiversity at Hope Farm. And with that, I'll pass on to you, Richard. Thanks, Georgie. Um, so I'm here to talk about the Farm Wildlife Partnership and package. But if I was to spend the next 15 minutes talking about what the six key actions are, you, a lot of you would say, well, I've heard all of this before. And this is because so many organisations were involved in its development that it's become embedded in so many of the schemes and initiatives that um, nature friendly farmers are adopting. So. I'm not going to do that. Uh, instead, I'm going to focus on some of the innovations that farmers have developed in order to deliver for um, farm wildlife and uh, encourage all of you really to think about ways in which you can engage in the knowledge sharing and share your own ideas and experiences. Because in reality, the changes to our guidance over the six or seven years that we've had the farm wildlife uh, resource available has been more towards the innovations of farmers delivering it than the new scientific evidence to support it. Sorry, I'm, for some reason I'm not getting a... Sorry, there we go. Um, so if I take myself back to 30 years ago when I started working for the RSV with farmers on the Stone Coolie project in Wessex or central southern England, um, I was going around advising farmers on how to help this one species and whilst I was doing that others were going to farmers in the same area talking about how to help marsh fertility butterflies and rare arable plants 
And sometimes I'm sure that our advice would have been contrary, uh, which could have confused a lot of farmers. But in reality, the needs of wildlife in Wessex, as everywhere, has more in common uh, than there are differences. And in reality, our stone kudu plots became havens for rare arable plants. And if a farmer was able to manage grassland to create a diversity that would encompass the needs of marsh artillery butterflies and stone kudus, then the biodiversity gain would be much greater than managing explicitly for one single species. So in reality, the, the lesson we learned from all of that was that a conservation strategy should be around restoring the habitats and stuffing them as much as possible with invertebrates and tweaking the management towards the needs of local priorities, but don't let one single species dictate the way the whole plan works. And really that's the background to farm wildlife, is that it's a clear and consistent guide to restoring nature that can be molded to tailored to the needs of specific farms and species, but fundamentally the principles remain consistent. And it has its roots in the voluntary initiative and the campaign for the farmed environment, where we were able to pull on the evidence from the likes of Natural England, the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust and RSPB, and match that with the practical delivery knowledge of FWAG uh, and the agricultural expertise of a whole host of agricultural organisations you can see here. And that fundamentally gives it the strength of, a, of a, a model that works for farmers and works for wildlife. And at the same time, Natural England were designing their environmental stewardship wildlife packages using exactly the same evidence and so there's an alignment between what farmers are doing and encouraged to do through agri-environment, what the campaign for the farmed environment's guidance is and, and what nature needs. And the Farm Wildlife Partnership was really born from that. Um, and it was a final check really that what we developed encompassed the needs of the widest range of nature. And the collective learning from uh, new evidence and innovations means that we can keep that resource live. So the six key actions remain constant, but the way that they are done maybe becomes easier and, and, and more effective through shared learning. Just uh, to remind you, for those of you for whom the six key actions just don't roll off the tongue, they are to restore uh, and enhance existing habitats, maximize the value of field boundaries and margins and create or restore seed rich habitats, flower rich habitats and wet features. And then last but not least, it's, it's basically the way you manage the, the in-field um, with wildlife in mind. And this is a much, as much to do with regenerative agriculture as it has to do with wildlife management. And so a combination of all of the habitats that you're supporting in conjunction with uh, good integrated pest management, soil management, nutrient management and water management means that holistically the whole system is, is working for nature and working with nature. And to that end, we have um, a resource, the Farm Wildlife website, which enables um, you to find out all about how to create and, and maintain habitats for wildlife and case studies of farmers doing it and innovations to improve practice or to overcome problems and problem solving. But we also have a, a sister website, Agricology, which very much is the hub of knowledge on everything to do with regenerative agriculture. And the success of that recipe is borne out in lots of really strong evidence. So not only Hope Farm, where we've seen these fantastic increases that, that, that Georgie alluded to earlier, uh, but also the monitoring of higher level stewardship in England uh, and other schemes across the UK, all point to uh, nature recovery on the back of using the six key actions. So Hope Farm's history, the last 20 years, it's all been about the six key actions. We've done nothing over and above it. That's, that's been the focus of what we've done. And we've seen a threefold increase in the number of red list farmland birds in the time we've been there, uh, a much greater increase in the number of wintering birds, and which have shown no signs of leveling off as yet, 
and likewise a fourfold increase in butterflies with no sign of that leveling off. We haven't actually managed to monitor bumblebees from day one because there wasn't a standard procedure for doing so when we started, but we've been monitoring in conjunction with a, a control site without the environmental features um, in recent years. And you only have to walk an average of 16 meters between bumblebees at Hope Farm compared with 313 meters on the control site. So innovation and how farmers are doing it. Um, I'm first of all going to turn to um, a case study from Fraser Hugill, who's a farmer in North Yorkshire and was the uh, North of England coordinator for the Campaign for the Farmed Environment, who's looked very much at the uh, challenges of, of extending the rotation of hedgerows. So we all know the benefits of, of extending the gap between the trimming of hedgerows in terms of the flowering of the hedgerows in between March and, and May, when it's so critical for pollinators emerging from hibernation to have a flower resource before the ground flora has really taken off. And few people have looked at this in more detail than, than Fraser. And he's basically adopted a, a twin approach of using a digger mounted finger bar cutter to cut through three to four year growth so that he can basically extend the rotation that long. And each time he's cutting, he's, he's cutting slightly outwards from, from the, the previous year, so, or the previous cut. So over time, the hedgerows are getting wider and taller. But obviously that means that at some point he needs to get that back to, uh, back to a starting position from which he can start to build outwards again. So on a longer rotation, he's needing to go in with something a bit more heavy, uh, uh, a tree shear, to really cut through thicker wood to get back to that sort of baseline from which he can grow the hedgerows out again. And um, this brash that is generated from this, this, this practice is then uh, much easier to sort of tidy up because you haven't got the, the, the sort of flail mowings um, put, poured all over the place. And that, that brash can be used as habitat piles or used to uh, trap sediment and slow flow of, of farm ditches uh, or used to feed a, a biomass burner. And this image just shows on the right a uh, hedgerow that's entering its third year since cut. And you can see already uh, it's, it, the flower abundance is, is on a par with um, the right, uh, sorry, the left of the image, which has um, uh, been managed uh, a lot longer since the previous cut. A second case study, which uh, is coming onto the Farm Wildlife website soon, is from Carl Sayer from the Pond Restoration Research Group at University College London. Uh, and they've looked at ghost pond restoration. Ghost ponds are effectively uh, previous farm ponds that at some point in history have been filled in. Uh, and what they've found is a remarkable speed of recovery of these wet features into something as useful and, and, and diverse as, as existing uh, well-managed uh, ponds. Um, basically, the, the, the sediment uh, under the ground retains the uh, propagation of, 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 the, of the plant species, of the ability to re restore those plant species. And basically, it's just a two-stage process of firstly locating the, um, the historic ponds and then excavating them out. Location can be the trickiest part. So using historic maps uh, and satellite images and aerial photographs, combined with talking to older farmers within the community who may indeed have been involved in filling some of these features in, um, allows them to guess pretty much where these features are, but then ground truthing that with field work, looking for any hint of uh, difference in soil moisture detected in the, in the difference in crop developments, so they can pinpoint where these, these features are. And then with a, a digger, digging two test trenches uh, at perpendicular across the diameter of the pond so that you get down to that very obvious uh, silty um, substrate of the historic pond, often um, full of uh, plant matter uh, and um, also shells of, of snails, which basically then, um, is gives you the clues to where, where where the whole dimension of the pond, both width, breadth, and and depth, can be uh, excavated out. 
and then carefully removing the infill until you get down to that substrate because it's as important to retain as much of that substrate as possible to get the best um, regeneration. And then it's very much a matter of leaving it to its own devices because um, as long as it's not been drained, in which case you might have to fill, block the drains, then these things will fill up and the plants will regenerate within a year. And indeed you can get rare plants um, or even locally extinct plants coming back from history up to 150 years old uh, and within a year have something that, that as closely as possible mirrors what, what was filled in. Uh, and it's so important, therefore, to, to use allow natural regeneration, both of the pond itself, but also the margin, to get as much of the historic flora back into it. Occasionally, you do get an algal bloom in the first year, but uh, uh, experience shows that uh, the, the water clears up very rapidly in subsequent years. And the final case study I want to just touch upon is that of Martin Lyons, our own Hope Farm contractor, who has gone insecticide free on his own farm six years ago uh, and remained towards the top of uh, his benchmarking group in terms of profitability in the process. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this because Martin's going to tell his own story in a, a later webinar in this series uh, in January and I'd very much encourage you to, to join that one. Uh, but just as a taster, uh, Martin's journey started when uh, he missed uh, um, a black bean aphid uh, spray window. Uh, and by the time the weather had improved sufficiently, uh, the, wet, the aphid numbers had dropped off. And he noticed that there were so many ladybirds in the field doing some of that job for him that he, he decided to let it lie and, and see what happened. And as a result, um, had a, a very good crop that um, showed no uh, net loss uh, at the, for that crop in that year. And it got him thinking about the efficacy of insecticides given the problems we're getting with resistance and the harm that they could be doing to a lot of those beneficials that could be doing a lot of that work for him. Uh, and he's basically um, taken a different approach which is basically to use as much of the integrated pest management techniques available to him to maximize the resilience of his system to try and avoid using insecticides going forward and that um, has allowed him from day one to build up a resilience that he's, he's, he's now very confident um, he can overcome uh, any um, pest infestations that he's faced and he just, just does not see pests reach, uh, reach economic thresholds anymore and he's met other farmers doing the same and it's really this collective um, experience that I've I'm really encouraging people to try and share. And that's really where I want to finish off, is that there is lots of information about farm wildlife habitat management on farmwildlife.info and on uh, regenerative agriculture uh, on agricology. Uh, the website uh, addresses on this slide and also the, um, the Twitter accounts. Uh, and when you look through that evidence, just reflect on your own experiences of native friendly farming and really dig down to whether or not you've actually got um, little nuggets of experience or ideas or problem solving that you've done on your farm which you think would be useful to share with others and if there are any ways in which you think you can help other farmers to become more nature friendly then please do get in touch with us um, if you go to the farm wildlife website farmwildlife.info there's a contact us tab or you can reach us directly farmwildlife.info forward slash contact hyphen us uh, and and give us your ideas and we will help you uh, find a way of sharing that experience with others and with that uh, i'd uh, pass back to georgie and thanks very much for listening um thanks very much richard uh, that was really interesting and to see those simple actions um, and how that can provide a brilliant framework for innovation for those farmers. Um, and it's amazing to see what farmers are doing from hedge cutting and making further use of that excess, that excess wood as it is a potentially precious resource um, that can be used both on and off farm. Um, and what these farmers are doing with practicality at the heart of their work, um, just from what, we've learned at Hope Farm um, 
what we actually did last year and digging out a pond as well. It was amazing to see within a year um, how much life returned to the pond. Um, thanks as well to listeners for the questions that are coming in. Um, really interesting to see what's popping up. And if any of you have any questions, don't wait to send them in, just write them down and we'll store them for the end or any experiences that you've had as well. Um, so yes, next up we have Chris um, from Butterfly Conservation. Um, Chris Corrigan is the UK Policy Officer for Butterfly Conservation, um, which is apparently the best conservation organisation in the UK. Um, I'm not sure about that, but we won't start picking hairs today. Um, having said that, he is passionate about all wildlife and not just butterflies and moths. Um, Chris worked in nature conservation um, and has done for over 30 years, um, mostly at the RSPB as conservation officer, regional director and then director England. Um, he has a strong belief that we will only reverse the declines in wildlife by working collaboratively alongside farmers and land managers and creating a policy framework which maintains livelihoods and enhances wildlife. Um, with that, I'll introduce Chris's talk. Um, he'll be walking through Butterfly Conservation's organisation and what they do with farmers. Um, farmland is an incredibly important habitat for wildlife, not least butterflies. And they are one of our key species groups that we have monitored at Hope Farm over the last 20 years. Um, although the change in butterfly biodiversity has been quite incredible on the farm, the changes that have been made to accommodate these species are nothing beyond what many farmers are achieving or can achieve on that far, on their farms. Um, so with that, I'll hand over to you, Chris. Great, thanks very much, Georgie. And, um, and thank goodness the uh, technology works and thank you everybody for tuning in. So this evening, I'll give you a very brief introduction to managing farmland to benefit butterflies. We haven't got much time, but hopefully this will give you at least some food for thought and encourage you to perhaps find out more, uh, particularly using some of the farm wildlife resources that Richard's uh, already talked about. So because we're um, a, a much smaller and less famous organisation than the RSBB, I thought I would start with a quick summary of some of the things that butterfly conservation does. So first off, this includes on the ground practical experience working with farmers and land managers to protect and enhance populations of some of our rarest and most threatened butterflies. But we also run long, long term surveys and collect and analyse millions of records collected by volunteers to monitor populations and produce uh, trends in, in numbers. And increasingly, we are combining this on the ground experience with the data and evidence to inform and influence uh, policy. Perhaps uh, less relevant to today's topic, but vital nonetheless, is the work we also do to engage and inspire people about butterflies and moths. After all, if people don't understand or experience butterflies, how can we expect them to care or want to protect them? So the biggest engagement project we run is the annual Big Butterfly Com Count. Hopefully lots of you took part this summer, but if not, uh, watch out for it next year, because actually this again provides useful data on how populations of butterflies are faring in the wider countryside. So to uh, start with a little bit of context, although much of this will be uh, familiar to you, I'm sure. However, what I would like to draw out from this background is that given that roughly two thirds of butterflies are declining, farmland is a really, really important habitat. How farms are managed has a major bearing on the overall population trends for many of the species of the UK countryside. And as well as playing a, an important role in its own right, providing more butterfly friendly habitats on farms can help provide corridors and connections between surrounding fragmented habitats, which can double the value of some of the uh, habitats that can be provided. And of course, what's welcome now is there seems to be an increasing emphasis 
on providing money and resources to uh, to help farmers manage land for the benefit of, of butterflies and other wildlife, rather than necessarily just for uh, direct subsidies. When considering uh, how we manage land for butterflies, we can perhaps break butterflies down into two broad groups. The first are the rare, threatened and declining high priority species. Typically these are specialist species with exacting habitat requirements. The key to protecting them is enthusiastic farmers working alongside advisors on tailored and targeted measures to recover populations. And these measures have to be tailored to the circumstances and conditions of the site, but also to the, uh, to the farm setup that there, there is in that location. The second group are the more widespread species which can benefit from more generic, widely applicable and tried and tested measures such as field margins and we'll talk about those a, a little bit more shortly. But let's start with the rare specialists and Richard talked about the marsh fritillary which is the species here and the marsh fritillary is actually one of the fastest declining European butterflies. So in the UK it's declined by about 80% since 1970 and it's disappeared from many of its former strongholds like Sussex uh, where I'm talking to you from uh, today. So that is really uh, sharp declines and what I will do is I'll just look in a little bit more detail at the marsh fritillary and what you need to do for the marsh fritillary particularly in those western locations which you can see on the, the distribution map there. So it is a species which is rare but it is found in all four countries uh, of the UK. When we talk about declines we, we, uh, we have different baselines on when we're talking about declines coming from um, but you can uh, think about baselines in, in all sorts of different ways and this perhaps this little anecdote from Northern Ireland paints a really horrific picture of the long-term declines which have affected marsh fritillaries but that will be reflected in much other wildlife too and I can't imagine a situation where marsh fritillaries are so abundant that they're being raked up and uh, into piles for burning which seems quite incredible uh, now. Luckily based on um, all our experience that we've gained uh, over the last few years working with uh, our advisors and farmers working together we know that these declines uh, can be halted and reversed. Whether we can ever get back to the plague proportions of Fermanagh is perhaps uh, is perhaps doubtful but nevertheless we know we can improve the, the outlook for this species and Richard mentioned the marsh fritillary in a chalk grassland context and there are some populations of uh, marsh fritillaries on chalk grasslands but by and large this is typically a butterfly of boggy unfertilized grassland with lots of devil's bit scabious which is the flower in the top right hand uh, corner of the slide and the key thing about the devil's bit scabious is this is actually the food plant for the caterpillar so without the devil's bit scabious you can't have marsh fritillaries. So when we talk about managing uh, a farm uh, for the benefit of marsh fritillaries what we're actually starting from is making sure that land is managed for the benefit of devil's bit scabious because if you get the devil's bit scabious then the marsh fritillaries uh, will follow. And the key to devil's bit scabious and maximizing devil's bit scabious is getting the management just right and basically the extensive management that's required relies on cattle grazing at just the right levels and those levels can be worked out by the advisors and the farmers working together to make sure that the, the levels are, are set at such a such a rate that you don't get undergrazing because with undergrazing what happens is is that other plants grow up particularly some of the more vigorous grasses and rushes and shade out and outcompete the field scabious but equally overgrazing will mean that the field the, the devil's bit scabious itself gets grazed out and there's no food plant for the butterflies so this is a really good example of farmers and, uh, and experts working together to try and work out the best management arrangements 
for that particular piece of land to suit uh, the, uh, the butterfly. Now, that's the marsh fritillary and the very exacting habitat requirements that that species got. But most farms won't have these rare or threatened species, but there is still plenty which will benefit the more wider, widespread, wider countryside species, some of which are also in decline. So as it's the Hope Farm 20th anniversary, I thought it would be appropriate to highlight work at the farm on what has been achieved. And what I'll pick out is the, um, is the measures that have been put in place under the Wild Pollinator and Farm Wildlife Package, which is part of the countryside stewardship arrangements, which is the grant scheme available in England. There are, of course, equivalent grant schemes in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, but this, in this case, we'll just focus on the English case. But the, the actual uh, principles are the same wherever you are. Richard showed this uh, graph and I thought I would talk a bit more because this actually shows what's been achieved at Hope Farm. So the red line is showing what's happening in terms of butterfly numbers at Hope Farm and the blue point is the point at which some of these more butterfly friendly measures were introduced. So the blue arrow shows 2007 has been a key date. Now you will see that there are wide fluctuations from year to year in the, in, in the numbers of butterflies. So 2012 looks a particularly bad year. And indeed it was a bad year, but that's not because of the management at Hope Farm. That's because butterflies are so um, significantly affected by things like weather and actually 2012 was a poor year everywhere. That Hope Farm, uh, line, although it fluctuates, is fluctuating in an encouragingly upward trajectory, unlike the UK index, uh, which is, is a smooth line to smooth out all those uh, nasty fluctuations, which shows actually there has been a decline across the whole country. So Hope Farm is bucking the trend, which is absolutely uh, fantastic. So what I uh, thought I would do in talking to Georgie was to actually look at, well, well, what is it? What is it about Hope Farm and the way that it's managed that actually makes a difference uh, to butterflies? What are the things that have, 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 have perhaps helped most? And what I would pick out are two measures. So the legume based pollen and nectar margins and the wildflower margins. And you'll see the areas there are, are relatively small um, whether, whether um, actually in absolute terms or as percentage of the farmed areas. And the key take home message from this is that actually um, a relatively small amount of land managed sympathetically for butterflies, uh, bees and, and other wildlife can actually make a big difference to the uh, outlook for butterflies on, on the farm, which is really fantastic to, uh, to see. And, and this is the sort of experience that we've found on farms right across the UK. Small measures, simple measures can make actually a disproportionately large uh, difference. And when we're thinking about butterflies, we often talk about pollinators and, and, and use bees, butterflies in the same breath. But there is an important difference. So whereas bees rely on the actual flowers for nectar and pollen, which of course butterflies do too, butterflies have the added dimension of requiring the right food plants for the caterpillars. So you can have all the flowers in the world, but if you haven't got the food plants to, a bit like the devil's bit scabious and the marsh fritillary, then, uh, then you won't get the butterflies. And in this case, we've got a lovely picture of an orange tip butterfly, which is one of the butterflies doing well at Hope Farm on a lady's smock. Now, in this case, it's taking the nectar, but lady's smock, along with garlic mustard, happens to be uh, the food plant of the butterfly too. But you do need both to get that success for the uh, butterflies. So in terms of wildflower margins, there's some excellent detailed advice on how to prepare and manage wildflower margins on the Farm Wildlife website. So I won't go into great detail uh, on that here or repeat it here, but there are a couple of key points that I would pick out um, if you're wanting to do wildflower margins on the things that are absolutely crucial in terms of ingredients for success. And the first one 
is reducing the nutrient levels in the soil. You've got to get those nutrient levels low. If nutrient levels are high, what happens is, is that the, the more vigorous grasses will outcompete the wildflowers um, and that will be nowhere near as valuable, particularly for the, uh, for the insects and uh, for the butterflies and other pollinators. And to do that requires grazing or cutting and collecting, cutting and baling to actually take off vegetation late in the season so that the flowers have got time to set seed. And that way from year to year, you will reduce the nutrient levels and it will take time. So you do need to be persistent. So the best margins at, uh, at Hope Farm are now 15 years old. So, so don't expect uh, results in the first year. And finally, uh, I've spoken a lot about uh, butterflies, but, um, but I have to say there are only 59 species of butterflies in the UK. In comparison, there are about 2,500 species of moth, many of which are important pollinators. Because most are nocturnal, they're harder to monitor, but broadly speaking, if butterflies uh, are doing well on your farm, then it's almost certain that moths like this spectacular garden tiger will be benefiting too. So uh, hopefully uh, this talk has given you at least a bit of a, uh, an introduction to butterflies. There's lots more uh, I could talk about and there's lots more you might want to find out about. Richard has talked about farm wildlife as a useful source of information. So please do uh, check that. Um, but in, in, in summary, um, farmland uh, particularly is a vital habitat for many butterflies and moths. And I think it's really important to say that Hope Farm has shown how relatively small changes can make a big difference to numbers of butterflies. And butterflies themselves are excellent em environmental indicators. So if you're doing things right for butterflies, the chances are you'll be doing things right for a lot of other wildlife too. Thanks very much for listening. That's brilliant. Thanks, Chris. Um, and that's great to hear that butterflies are a good indi indicator species as they're doing particularly well at Hope Farm. Um, but no, it's really interesting to hear about the different management that you can do for specific species. Um, and I think it's well worth having a dig and seeing if there's anything that can be done for local priority species for the farmers out there as well. Um, I think if you go on the Farm Wildlife website um, and ask on there, then someone will be able to help you out. Um, Hope Farm, for instance, with us, the bird species is turtle dove. So we have been working with um, Operation Turtle Dove to do what we can there. Um, also really interesting to hear about the food plants and flowers being really important for species, uh, butterflies. Um, so next up we have Shelley um, and Shelley is the facilitator for the Fair to Nature Certification Scheme and she'll talk about her 11 years of experience with the scheme from its origins as Bill Jordan's conservation grade through to its fresh relaunch early next year. The Fair to Nature Certification provides rewards to farmers for nature friendly farming helps consumers to identify and support wildlife friendly produce and also allows producers and supermarkets to market their business. Um, at Hope Farm so far we've used it to market niche crops like millet and our bottled rapeseed oil, um, not only diversifying our rotation but our income streams as well. Um, we're also looking at more crops that we can market under this label in future years. Um, so with that Shelley I will pass over to you. Thank you very much, Georgie, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, yes, Fair to Nature. I don't know if um, how many of you listening will have um, heard of the Fair to Nature scheme. If there's some arable farmers among you, then probably you, you will have. Um, but this is our current logo. It's been through quite a few iterations, but this is the current one. Uh, it's an evidence-based farm assurance scheme. Um, that 
It, it's focused on reversing the declines in farmland biodiversity and we have heard from both Richard and Chris about those declines. Um, it's evidence-based because various projects and research has um, fed into it over the years. It all started back with the Manor Farm project up in a farm in Yorkshire um, and the Farm, farming for Wildlife project that took place in Oxfordshire. Those projects were managed by the Centre for Hydrology and Ecology and they were looking at various habitats on farms, on the positions of habitats and um, where to site them on the farm and how much you need to reverse the declines in biodiversity. And all that fed into the Fair to Nature scheme since then we've done lots of various MSc projects and PhD projects to feed into the, the evolving scheme. As Georgie said, it was co-founded by Bill Jordan and called Conservation Grade in its early days, back in 1989 when Bill was looking for a, a nature-friendly source of oats for his oat cereals, Jordan cereals. It was very much a Jordan's based scheme for, for many years um, and it became separate from Jordan's in 2009 and it was able to expand out into, into other food brands and other supply chains then and we took on a, a few more licensees as we call the brands. Then in 2017 Bill wanted to step back from conservation grade and conserva um, concentrate on Jordan's Mill in Biggleswade as a, a visitor centre and his nature reserve Pensorp in, in Norfolk. So Conservation Grade had been working with the RSPB for quite a few years by then and the RSPB very much liked the scheme and saw that it actually delivered for wildlife on farms uh, so decided to take the scheme over in 2017. I, as Georgie said, I have been working with the scheme for 11 years, so I started in 2009 and um, now I'm very fortunate to be able to work with the RSPB on the scheme. In the last 18 months, we have been working really hard behind the scenes with Fair to Nature members and Farm Wildlife Partnership and the, the Nature Friendly Farming Network to refresh the standard because it started off with supplying oats to Jordans. It was very much a, an arable based um, scheme. And we wanted to broaden it out to more um, farming systems, particularly livestock, uh, so that it wasn't just limited to lowland arable. And uh, we've managed that and we're very much looking forward to um, launching the refresh standard in uh, early next year, hopefully, all being well. Uh, Richard and Chris and Georgie have touched on the, the um, declines in farmland and wildlife that we all know about. Uh, sources of these figures are from the, the State of Nature reports of 2013 and 2016, um, which did highlight the, the dire state of farmland biodiversity. Um, and schemes such as Fair to Nature um, are very important to reverse those, halt them initially and, and hopefully reverse those declines. This is a very simple diagram of how Fair to Nature works on the farms. You can see um, the bread in the corner is to illustrate the brands. Uh, we did have Allenson bread on board for a, a time and um, we gained quite a lot of farming members through that link up with Allenson Bread. So they source the products from our Fair to Nature farmers and so they supply contracts to the Fair to Nature farmers and they also often pay a, a premium for that produce. Uh, sometimes it can just be an access to market by being uh, a Fair to Nature farmer. But, but often there are, there's a premium involved. Um, 
The brand gets pays a license fee to Fair to Nature and that funds the advice that we give to the farmers and running the scheme. And also the brand is able to increase the awareness of the scheme. The brand gets endorsement for its brand. It can put the logo on its packaging. It gets provided with case studies from the farmers. Um, it gets to know the farmers who are producing for them better. Um, it gets to um, help, it helps to meet its corporate social responsibility targets. And it has reassurance that its farmers are farming in a nature friendly way because we audit the, the farms. Uh, as well as getting a premium for their product, the farms get a lot of training and advice on how to implement habitats on their farms and then they get the access to contracts. And then the big winner out of all of it is the biodiversity. How is Fair to Nature different from other schemes that are out there? Because there are quite a few other schemes, but Fair to Nature is different because it has a 10% habitat ask. Um, some people think 10%, that doesn't sound a great deal. Other people, quite often those who are in farming, say, oh, 10% of my farm, that, that is quite a big area. But the 10% has been shown through all the, the various um, research projects that have fed into Fair to Nature, uh, that this is the area that can make a real difference to wildlife. And the 10% habitat ask now incorporates the six elements of farm wildlife. And it also links brands with nature friendly farmers to help fund the habitat work. That, that is very important because um, it's not just relying on agri-environment funding to do that work. And this is a little juvenile corncrake on um, Bill Jordan's farm in, in Norfolk actually. As I said earlier, we've, we're very pleased that we've been able to mm -hmm refresh the standard and make it work for livestock farmers. So we're, we're looking forward to working with more and more livestock farmers. And um, we've worked quite closely on refreshing the standard with livestock farmers who are members of the Nature Friendly Farming Network. They've been very helpful. The Fair to Nature standard is what the Fair to Nature farmers work to and what they are audited on. Uh, there are eight main areas that are covered. The conservation area deals with the habitat creation and management. Uh, soil covers steps to improve soil structure. That is, is vitally important um, for both managing the habitats and for growing your crops. And the carbon section encourages our members to undertake a carbon audit. And then once they've got that baseline level, they can work towards improvements in um, carbon usage, carbon capture over their years of membership. The livestock section focuses on the integrated management of parasites and um, sustainable sourcing of feed, plus how long the stock has been on a fair to nature farm. So that's quite a new one for, for the fair to nature standard. Aquachemicals, uh, we require our members to create a, an integrated farm management plan and try and take steps each year towards um, encompassing um, elements of that um, plan to reduce their pesticide usage. We also require the farmers to create nutrient plans and uh, water management and pollution plans as well. And we also provide quite a bit of training. The new farmers to the scheme undergo an induction training course. They are provided with a manual which helps them create the habitats and comply, compile with, sorry, comply with the um, various plans that they need to create. 
So they're not left on their own. Um, each year they're encouraged to uh, attend a training course as well and advice is on the end of a line and email. And they can also exchange knowledge with each other. They're part of a, a club, so to speak. So let's move on to the various habitats under the Fair to Nature standard. We have wildlife rich boundaries and margins. Um, most of these photos are taken, in fact, all of them are taken on, a, on Fair to Nature farms. And this farmer here was encouraging this hedge to grow wider and thicker. And we had a grassy margin along the side with um, sown wild flowers in it. Plus along the hedge line, there were some standard hedgerow trees. Uh, vitally important for, um, sorry, I was trying to change the slide. Vitally important for linking up habitats. They're like wildlife corridors, wildlife motorways around the farm. And then hopefully linking habitats to neighbouring farms as well. Uh, this is a particularly floristic margin next to a, quite a wide hedge. Uh, this is on a fed niche farm down in Hampshire and it was buzzing with wildlife. And this margin here is again close to a, a very well managed hedge for wildlife, very floristic and this was adjacent to a hayfield. And in fact, this is um, Bill Jordan's farm in, in Norfolk. The next type of habitat is a flower rich habitat. And um, we encourage wild meadow type wildflowers. So they're long lasting, um, long flowering season. And we also encourage areas of legume type habitat. So vetches and clovers, shorter flowering season, but they start flowering earlier in the season. And those two habitats um, mean there's a very long, can be a very long flowering season on the farm and they suit lots of different types of pollinating insects and other invertebrates. And this was a bumblebird mix actually because it's got some phacelia and some mustard in it. So it acted as a very good habitat for pollinators and then over the winter months, it fed the birds. Here's another floristic habitat. This is full of oxeye daisies, and this was in, this is in Hampshire actually. And again, that was buzzing with life. Then we move on to seed rich habitats. These are very important to um, feed farmland birds over the hungry gap. So late winter, early spring, um, when other food sources have run out. And this one here, you can see it's got kale in, this is a two year mix. It's also um, a very good wildlife margin there. You've got the hedge and the standard trees next to it. But this is quite an important mix for uh, habitat for fair to nature. This is on the Isle of Wight, fair to nature farm on the Isle of Wight, and this is a newly sown um, bird food mix. And this was actually hand broadcast because it's a small area and the particular farm didn't have the machinery to, to sow it. And it's, it's worked really well. And this habitat is on a farm in Cambridgeshire, Fetternich Farm in Cambridgeshire. And this is a combination of all, well, a lot of the great habitats in the scheme. We've got the hedge and um, behind that hedge was a, a spinney managed for wildlife. We have a, a wildflower margin, very floristic for the pollinators. And then next to that, between that and the crop, we have a bird food margin, bird food strip. So that is covering a plethora of wildlife. And then as part of um, farm wildlife, one of the uh, six key actions is to have some wet features on your land. Um, we know that wet features are very important to lots of different wildlife. And during lockdown, I have noticed, uh, particularly on social media, that the big thing is 
putting ponds in your garden. People have been using lockdown to uh, dig ponds in their garden and they've been astounded by the, the um, wildlife that has visited their ponds. And there's a particularly good farm in on the Cambridgeshire Fens, a fair to nature farm again, and they've um, dug some wader scrapes and here is an oyster, oyster catcher enjoying itself in the wader scrapes. I've seen golden plover and all sorts of birds on that habitat, it's, it's fantastic. So we do also allow um, things like cover crops, overwintered stubbles to count towards the habitat, but they have a, a conversion factor because they don't provide as much um, um, food source for pollinators and, and bird life as some of the other habitats. So there is a conversion factor available for them. And that is all in the, the training manual we provide. And we will also count native woodland that um, has been established in the last 20 years and is managed well for, for wildlife. Um, Shelley? Yes? Hello. I Hello. was just wanting to say that we're near, we've got a little bit of time left for Q&A. Are you near the end of your presentation? I am quite near, yes. <laughs> okay. If I run over a bit. Uh, a little bit. I okay. just wanted to say that we do have time to um, we have an extra 15 minutes bolted on, so we will be running the webinar until quarter to eight and there will still be time for uh, okay. the questions to be answered. Brilliant. OK, then. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, we have um, in Fair to Nature, we have two, two levels of membership. We have the foundation membership and where you can join and then you can work up towards uh, full membership. And when you get to full membership, if you have all the habitats in place at the start, you can go straight into full membership, but then you can choose to supply our brands, our Fair to Nature brands, and undergo an audit. So what are the benefits to farmers? Well, as I've said, you can get a premium price, often get a premium price for your produce and access to markets. Um, it's an additional income stream and you get a lot of advice on habitat management and it's good to exchange knowledge with like-minded farmers. We use Hope Farm quite a lot as um, a demonstration farm. Um, Hope Farm joined Fair to Nature in 2015. Here are some of the brands that are currently with us. Um, we're quite big in the bird food sector at the moment, so all the RSPB bird food, where possible, um, we don't currently credit peanuts, but where possible is sourced on Fair to Nature Farms and Hope Farm itself produces um, a rapeseed oil that is Fair to Nature accredited. Here are some of the benefits to the brands. It could be an access to a nature friendly supply chain. It can help them meet their corporate social responsibility targets. Um, it's a way to differentiate themselves and it also provides them with a lot of good news stories and case studies um, that they can use in their PR and marketing. Uh, so finally comes to the, the last slide. And if you do want to get in touch and find out more about Fair to Nature, we have a website, fairtonature.org. Uh, we're on Facebook and Twitter, and you're very welcome to send me an email if you want any more information. So thank you very much for listening. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Shelley. Um, and I hope that's just given you a whiz round of the different, well, the amazing habitats that these farmers uh, that are part of Na Fair to Nature are putting in place. Um, and I'm really excited to see uh, that relaunch at the beginning of the year um, and this really being rolled out on a much bigger scale. Um, so it's brilliant to see this whole stream of questions that we've got going in and we will do our best to get through as many as possible. Um, I will not delay any further but to welcome the rest of the panellists uh, back into view um, and Sophie if you would like to fire away with the first questions please and we will get going. Yeah so the first question we've got here is is the farming at Hope Farm completely organic? Um, 
thanks very much for that question um and that is a simple one to answer i'll i'll take that on um the farming is not organic and we chose that for the reason that we want to be as relevant to as many farmers as possible and make the things that we do as accessible as possible um, having said that, we do take a lot of lessons from the organic um, farmers. So yeah, that, that's this in a nutshell, really, in case there's anything else anybody else would like to add. I'm going to take that as a no. Um, OK, so we've then got a couple of questions come in um, about how do you work out where there used to be a historic pond or a ghost pond? Um, Grand, thank you very much for that question and I think I'll pass that one over to Richard. Uh, yeah, so obviously this, this research from the um, University College London, they, they looked at using historic maps, so historic OS maps, uh, you can pick up farm ponds from that uh, and then, like I say, ground truth them on the ground and talking to uh, older farmers within the community. Um, there will be a full case study on this on the Farm World Love website coming up uh, and uh, I would refer folk to that for full details because it is quite um, a sort of pro good process they've developed to go through um, but yeah there's lots of tools to, to doing that. Thank you for that Richard. Um, Sophie if we could have the next question please. Yeah, um, so the next one is, what are Richard and Georgie's thoughts on the most effective methods for replacing herbicides to control thistles, ragwort, blackgrass, etc.? Um, again, thank you, a very good question. Uh, we do have issues with those weeds on farm. It's a nutrient-rich, uh, heavy clay soils. Um, but the blackgrass tends to be the biggest issue in our cereal crops out in the field, whilst the things like the ragwort and the thistles they tend to feature more in the wildflower margins and the conservation habitats. Um, and we do use herbicides to control um, different weeds that we have on the farm. Having said that, ragwort's not too much of an issue. Um, we see hardly any of that out on the farm. Um, but thistles, certainly at the time of establishing the wildflower margins, they, uh, it's really important to keep those under control. Um, we start off with the stale seed bed and establishing the wildflower margins and um, actually in the first year, so we use herbicides to control them before putting the seed in, but once the flower margins are in place, actually mowing in year one every three weeks or so a month um, does a really good job of keeping those thistles under control and then in the following year you have a much cleaner wildflower margin um, and the cutting and baling that is also quite good at keeping the nutrients low which helps to prevent uh, grasses and other weeds overtaking the wildflowers. Um, out in the field, you can't just go for the um, can for controlling black grass. We use rotations, um, being careful with our cultivations, spring cropping as a really important tool there, um, and really having a no tolerance approach. At the moment, it's fair to say that we are reliant on herbicides, partially to control the um, black grass, but we are working so that we get the soils clean enough and having that no tolerance approach, um, reducing our cultivations and we're working towards a system where we can be using cover crops to um, help prevent um, or outcompete the black grasses. And that does actually do quite a good job of keeping a ground cover um, and getting the soil in better conditions so that both the cover crops and the following crop um, we've seen visibly has helped to uh, reduce black grass on our fields. Not sure if you have anything to add to that, Richard. No, it's just yeah, the full IPM. So black grass, like you say, it's 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 just one of the tools, herbicides, and you've got to use the whole suite um, smartly to to get it right. Um, yeah, I think now it's very common agricultural practice as a way of doing dealing with black grass. Um, thanks, Richard. Um, next question, please, Sophie. Yeah, um, so Hope Farm doesn't let one species determine their management plan, but for some butterflies, you will need a specific species approach. How do you handle this? Well, I, I, I would, um, Hope Farm, we've <laughs> sort of got um, the situation where there aren't many high priority local species to be 
dealing with. But I'll just refer um, the questioner to um, a case study where, for example, in, in, in Devon, you might have seal buntings, uh, grey long-eared bats and rare arable plants all on the same farm. And really, it's a matter of t tweaking the Farm Wildlife 6 key actions to those species. So in that scenario, rather than wild bird seed mixture crops left unharvested over winter, you would, would focus more on extensive stubble management. Um, seal buntings respond to that much better than they do actually to um, seed mixtures. And obviously the rare arable plants, um, you cater for that way as well. And then again, with insects, food for soil buntings and bats, and um, the, the seminatural grasslands of that area are vital to that. So seminatural grassland management under the enhancing the, the existing habitats and creating a good, strong diversity of field boundaries and margins for the bats as well are kind of key ways that you would focus the effort. So it's basically just looking at the needs of the priority species and looking at how you basically adapt the six key actions to, to those needs. And normally the, the needs of priority species, they're very much in alignment because they're in the same farm landscape for a reason. They are benefiting from a kind of management that at least historically has been um, supporting them for, for centuries. Yeah, thank, thanks very much for that, Richard. Do you want me to add to that, Georgie? Just uh, very, very brief. So very briefly, thanks for the question. I think that's, re that's really good. Um, in most cases, as Richard's outlined, there isn't uh, conflicts and Hope Farm in a way is fortunate because it doesn't, have, it doesn't have any of those super rare fussy butterflies that require specific things. But you can on occasion come into uh, some conflicts. So if I looked at an example, but they're rare. So if I looked at uh, chalk grassland, for example, which is a very fragmented uh, habitat, um, and there are a range of those specialist um, rare and threatened species on, on chalk grasslands. Some species like really tightly grazed uh, chalk grasslands with no scrub, so things like the Adonis blue. So some other species like much more, um, much longer swords with scrubs or things like the Duke of Burgundy. So if you applied a one size fits all approach to your management of chalk grasslands, you'd do really well for one species, but another species would really suffer. Um, so the key thing there is being very clear what species you're focusing on for that particular patch and tailoring your management then according to that species that occurs there. Grand, thanks for that, Chris. I think we have time for one or perhaps two more questions. Um, so Sophie, uh, choose wisely. And of course, yeah, the rest will be answered, but we'll send them over on a document to you. Yep, so the next one is, how many brands are in the Fair to Nature scheme currently? Pass that over to you, Shelley. Uh, well, we currently have, um... I'm just going to count them up in my mind. <laughs> we currently have uh, five brands in the scheme currently. Um, there are quite a few that are bird food related and um, take crops like uh, millet from Hope Farm um, and wheat and all the different bird uh, seeds that go into bird food like canary seed. And um, then we have some brands that are farm-based ones like Lordington Lavender or Honey Chop Horse Feed, they use fair to nature um, crops on their land and sell direct to customers from the farm. And we have Allison Flower who take fair to nature wheat and use that in two of their lines of flour. Thank you very much, Shelley. The last question, Sophie. Uh, yeah, so, and Oh, I've lost my question. Sorry. What weighting value do you put on winter stubble and cover crops in Fair to Nature? And is that value dependent on the species mix of the cover crop? I'll pass that over to you, Shelley and Richard. I believe you had some input into the standard as well. I think Richard will be best to ask, answer this one. Gosh. <laughs> um, hmm. To be honest, I'm in terms of a weighting, so we, the, we do have conversion factors for some habitats. So, for example, we know that um, 
five hectares of stubble um, in terms of a seed resource for, for farmland birds equates to one hectare of wild bird seed mix. So, so whilst we have 10% of land managed for nature, if, if, it's, if it's actually retaining stubbles rather than creating seed rich habitats that you leave over winter um, and don't harvest, then, then you would need a, a larger area. Um, so yeah, in that example, we would have, yeah, you would you want five hectares of stubble to equate to one hectare of habitat. Um, but farmers that retain, uh, uh, use spring crops and retain stubbles generally do those on a larger scale than they, they have field margins, habitats anyway. So it fits in with the system. Grand. Thank you very much for that. Um, and thank you from me to the speakers uh, for your brilliant talks that you've had, for Sophie, um, who's been saying out the questions and also Sophie from the events team who's been behind the scenes as well um, and yeah thanks to all your listeners uh, and please do take a look as well just as a final one from me um, at our future webinars that we have lined up for the rest of the series. Um, we now have links and dates for a whole series from insecticide free soils cover crops um, looking at future funding as well and ecological intensification. So some really exciting topics um, and yeah, please do join us again and thank you very much. Good night. <laughs>